Welcome all of you uh, tonight. I'm Robert Jackler. I'm an ear surgeon at Stanford and I'm going to share with you some insights into um, hearing and hearing loss and some of the futures of technology as it relates to the ear. I see it's a good group of people here tonight. I appreciate you all coming out. Um, can you imagine a world in silence? A world in which you could not hear Bach or Beethoven? You could not hear your grandchild's giggle? You could not hear a politician's speech. Well, two out of three ain't bad, <laughs> at least. Um, but you know, um, hearing loss represents a major problem in life. It impairs for children the ability to learn. It can limit the kinds of choices a young person can have occupationally. As you know, as you look especially at senior citizens who can no longer enjoy a restaurant or perhaps going to a lecture like this easily, um, it leads to social isolation. And people that don't hear well tend to be depressed. Um, and also, as we've learned recently, people who don't hear well have a higher rate of diminished function as they get older of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And that may well be a withdrawal of social contact and interaction that when the brain doesn't have stimulation and exercise, uh, it begins to deteriorate in its function. Now, Helen Keller had a unique perspective. She was both blind and deaf. And what she said is that blindness separates me from things, but deafness separates us from people. And the essence of what we are as human beings is the ability to communicate with our family, with our friends, and our coworkers. And hearing is the essential connection of that. Two out of three out of a thousand uh, children are born deaf. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Half of all seniors over 70 have significant hearing loss. And hearing loss affects, if you will, 36 million Americans. Now we have an initiative here, and I meant to bring brochures, and I apologize I didn't. For those of you interested, you can go to a website called hearinglosscure.stanford.edu or simply Google hearing loss Stanford or research. Um, because this is such a major concern, we have a major effort here with a large group of scientists, a team of 70 at present, working to overcome deafness through regenerative means, to restore lost hearing. So it's a major effort with many different facets that we'll talk about later. Now to understand about hearing, you first have to understand about the ear. And as you can see here, um, it begins with the ear canal and sound enters and strikes the eardrum. Forgive me on the tape, I'm coming over here a bit. Um, you see the tympanic membrane or eardrum gathers the sound through a chain of three bones to vibrate within the inner ear, the cochlea, which then generates a signal over the hearing nerve to the hearing part of the brain. Notice that the inner ear has both the hearing portion and a balance portion, and we'll talk about that. Now imagine sound, which is just vibrations in air, going down the ear canal, catching the eardrum, vibrating the chain, and then the inner ear taking the richness of all the different tones of sound, separating it out and passing it on to the brain in a way that's intelligible as human speech or music or honking bus. Now, let's start off with the middle ear. Here's the eardrum, the malleus, the incus and stapes, simply hammer, anvil, and stirrup. The way the middle ear works is that the inner ear, the cochlea, is filled with fluid. Sound is in air. When you put your head under water, the sound above is softer and sounds very funny. You have to match the impedance. So the eardrum is large compared with the third bone of hearing that interfaces called the stapes. So you have basically a hydraulic lever that says the eardrum is a big place, the stapes footplate is a small place. So it gathers energy from the air. The bones are also cantilevered, much like a pump, because the first bone, the malleus, is longer than the incus. It acts as a mechanical advantage to further amplify the sound. Now let's pass from the middle ear with the hearing bones and the drum to the inner ear. It's called the cochlea, which is simply Greek for snail. It has two and three quarter turns, a very efficient structure, if you will, for packing things together. Within the organ of cordy, um, is what within the inner ear, the cochlea, is the structure of hearing called the organ of cordy. 
That organ of Cordy is where the hair cells are that sense vibrations and turn them into nerve impulses. Much as in the back of the eye, you may know you have rods and cones, you have hair cells within the inner ear. And in these various fluid-filled chambers, the vibrations pass upward, and then you see this membrane vibrates, and this series of hairs generate signals to the hearing nerve. Now this is a beautiful illustration by an artist that works closely with our department. And you can see here the outer and inner hair cells. And when this membrane vibrates, those little hairs bend, generating nerve signals. Now this is a hair cell up close and personal. You can see on the top there are little stereocilia. They're actually not hairs. No, if we regrow hair cells in the inner ear, we do not have a cure for baldness. It's a very different type of structure. These are stereocilia. But what happens when the vibration goes into the inner ear, different tones vibrate in different areas. Okay, So the inner ear is this wonderful ability to discriminate different tones and to separate those tones in a way that the right part of the hearing nerve is stimulated for every note and key on the piano keyboard. Now imagine if I tied a jump rope to the other wall and started to go like this. It would set up a wave pattern. If I go faster, it would be a different wave pattern. Well, that's what the inner ear does. So as this basement membrane vibrates from sound, the hair cells send a signal to the nerve fibers. Those nerve fibers travel down that central core of the cochlea into the hearing nerve, and from that inner ear and hearing nerve, they pass into the brain stem, then up through the thalamus, and on to an area of the brain and the floor of the insula that's the primary area where sound is understood. Of course, the hearing interacts then with areas of cognition and vision and other areas to give you a sense of where that sound from, comes from, to interpret it, to compare it with the memory about language uh, in, your, in your brain. Now the second part of the inner ear are the balance system. And this is actually very ancient. It exists throughout all the way down to fishes. And it is three different loops in each plane of space. And when those loops move, you sense motion. And you have one on each side, and they work in a pair. Imagine rowing a boat. Most of you rowed a boat, right? When you go to turn, one goes forward and one goes back. And that's the efficient way to turn, right? So if, and they're normally moving, OK? There's constant input. So if all of a sudden one inner ear stops working, what's going to happen? The oar still goes and you spin round and round. That's what vertigo is. And so when the inner ear suddenly has a disease, you get spinning and dizziness. Now, uh, let me illustrate for you how the inner ear balance system works. Most important thing that it does is it stabilizes images in motion. So imagine as we were evolving in the jungle. And in order to eat, we had to be able to run after an animal holding a spear. There's a rabbit bouncing, and you have to keep that rabbit right on your eyes and then hit it with the arrow to go home and reproduce and send your superior genes to the next generation, OK? So how does that happen? Well, take your hands and look in front of you. Now move your hand back and forth. Take one hand. Now you'll see it rapidly blurs. Hold it still now and do the same relative motion. Whip your head back and forth. It should be dead still. That's your inner ears. It's called the vestibular ocular reflex. If that didn't work, see me in the office. <laughs> now, what's actually going on here is within this loop, there's a little flap called a crista ampullaris. And in the base of that are a series of hair cells. So there's a fluid-filled column in the loop. And as your head moves, that flap moves back and forth. Constantly, that's what you're, you're doing to keep oriented. Now, let's talk about hearing. It, the way that we measure hearing is in a soundproof room by a professional called an audiologist. Now, in order to understand how hearing's tested, we have to know a little bit about something called the decibel scale, right? This represents the force of the sound. Imagine dropping a pebble in water and you see those rings. That's what sound is about. I'm speaking at around 70 decibels now. Unfortunately, that's freeway traffic as well. But you know, around that level, as you get up to 90 or 100 decibels, it's loud enough to hurt the ear. And the threshold of hearing for a normal hearing person 
is zero decibels. Just get a general sense of that. That's important because you know when you talk about vision, you hear 2020. But when you talk about hearing, you talk about normal being zero to 25 or so. And mild, moderate, and even severe hearing loss is when a very loud sound of 90 decibels, you don't even hear it. Now, there are two aspects to hearing. One is, how loud is it? But an even more important aspect is how clear is it? Because you can take a hearing aid and make it really loud. That's easy to do. But actually making it improve the clarity. So some people's ears who have hearing loss still hear with great clarity, and hearing aids work perfect for them. Others have distortions. And no matter how much you fiddle with the telephone, the wire is broken, and it can't carry a clear signal up. Now, I'll tell you a funny story. I, for years, have used that metaphor, and everyone in this room, I think, is over the age of 30 or 40 and knows it. You tell this to a young person, they cannot conceive of a telephone with a wire. <laughs> I have no idea what I was talking about. Now, this is, this is an audiogram or a hearing test. This is how the results are displayed. The, little, the red line is the right ear. The blue line is the left ear. And imagine you're looking at a piano keyboard. The low notes here, the middle notes here, and the high notes over there. Now, somebody who's totally deaf and without hearing is going to be way down at the bottom. They'll feel it. The low frequencies, they'll feel it and respond. But the most important thing we listen to are people talking. And human speech is in the frequencies between 500 and 3,000 hertz in this box. And I'm talking right around down here. Men, a little lower frequency. Women, a little higher frequency. So that's the most important area. But if you think about human speech, there are two domains of frequencies. Vowels produced here by your larynx. Ah, e, u, o. They're quite low frequency. Consonants have the sound shaped by the lips and your mouth and nose. P, k, f, s. Now, most of you realize that the difficulties we have in speech is in understanding the consonant sounds, because our hearing loss usually affects the high frequencies first. So if I say soap, pope, and cope, people hear the ope and ope, but not the s, p, k, as well, because of the high frequency hearing loss. Now, the most common hearing loss there is, is the gradual loss of hearing as we get older. And that happens for most of us. Even if you look at um, nuns that were brought up in silence, they lose a bit of hearing over time. However, our ears were not designed growing up in the jungle. They were never the sounds that we have today. So that much of the changes in aging, especially in men who like to go and be in military service and work in factories and the likes, um, a lot of it is the wear and tear from excessive noise. But there is a preordained, just as we get gray and white hair getting older, loss of hearing that happens. It happens in a large fraction of people, more in men than women. And it doesn't seem to be especially associated with the major illnesses, diabetes and high blood pressure growing older. And it's at least in part genetically determined. If your father had hearing loss at age 60, it's more likely than not that you will start developing it, given today's medicine and health, at the same time. And what happens is in the high frequency areas, these hair cells begin to disappear. And so again, looking at that cochlear spiral, the bottom portion, which are the very high frequencies, by the time you're 25 years of age, some of those very high frequencies are already gone. And it works its way down, again, up the cochlear spiral over time. The good news is, is that aging-related hearing loss almost never results in deafness. It simply makes one hard of hearing. So here's someone, say, in their 40s. You see how the high pitches are dropping down equally in the right and left ear a little further. You see the speech range here is still OK. And then further down and further down. And eventually, it starts to affect the high frequencies enough so that consonants in a noisy background begin to become difficult. Now, I'll mention that consonants are lip sounds. So you can tell the difference between hope and soap even without any training in lip reading. So in a noisy restaurant, if you sit and face someone, you get kind of the gist of what they're saying, and you can figure out what they're saying pretty well. 
Now, I will mention something that as people get older, they often feel, you know, I don't want people to know I have a hearing loss. I don't want to wear a hearing aid because people think I'm old or deaf and dumb or something like that. But l life is changing in that. It's becoming very popular to wear an ear device, as we'll talk about. It really is. The kids are doing it, right? And so I'll tell you, you have two choices. You can sit at that dinner table and just, when someone says something to you, you can smile and nod, and I'll tell you what they're going to conclude, right? Okay? Or you can say, hey, I don't hear you very well. <laughs> Speak up and look at me face to face, and it's usually best to do that, or to get some help. So aging loss is seldom worse than this. Now, if we look at the curves from the ages of 30, 40, 50, you can see that the loss in the high frequencies tends to happen in the older folks, 70s and 80s, and beyond. Now the second most common cause of hearing loss is wear and tear from loud noises because those break hair cells within the inner ear. Some of this can be recreational, um, you know, some of it can be occupational for those who work in factories, that kind of thing. Um, but imagine rock music. Have you ever noticed that rock music is all low tone emphasis? Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. There are no piccolos in a rock band for a good reason. Rock, professional rock musicians, having listened to amplified music for years, no longer have any high frequencies. <laughs> so if you look at the noisiness, it turns out you can listen to ordinary sound all day long and it won't hurt your ears. It will not wear out your ears. Um, on the other hand, if it gets up about 90 decibels and more, which is a pretty loud sound, it begins to injure the ears. So if a fire engine goes by, put your hand up over your ears, okay? Protect yourself. Because, you know, when you add the aging changes together with wear and tear from loud noises, that's not a good thing. They're additive and it makes things worse. So imagine uh, if you go out shooting, right? Impulse noises as opposed to continuous noises get into the ear and damage it more. So it turns out your ear has a defense against continuous loud noise. There are little muscles that tighten up in the ear and, and actually reduce your sound uh, appreciation a bit. But a gunshot slams in and damages the ear even more. So I have seen teens go out in the backyard and shooting a whole afternoon, and one of the two teens comes in almost deaf the next day. The good news is, is that it partially recovered. But there are people susceptible to loud noises. If you will, there are differences in repair mechanisms in the inner ears. Um, and this is what it looks like. Again, noise-induced loss. You see there's a little notch. Again, all high-frequency type of loss, just to give you an idea. Now, this shows something which is called a temporary threshold shift. Now, if you've ever been to a concert or ever been in a really loud place, you notice your ears feel a little hollow and kind of ring? Okay, if we tested your hearing then, you'd have a big high frequency notch. And then over time, it repairs and cuts better. Uh, and by the next morning, it would be better. Now, if you want to see this in your day-to-day -day life, after you've driven on the freeway with the radio on, leave the radio just where it was. The next morning, you come and turn on your car, and you go, oh my god, that's so loud. So you've been listening to it you know, pretty loud over the wind noise and the road noise and all those kinds of things. So it can sneak in that way. Uh, things that can cause that kind of shift are enough to cause a permanent hearing loss, partially. And this is what happens with a temporary loss. The hair cells push over, and they may repair. Some people are very good and have steel ears and repair very well. Other people have tin ears and they're more likely to sustain a permanent hearing loss. Now, if you want to measure the sound of something, you can grab an iPhone app that will allow you to measure the sound level. They have them for free or 99 cents. And that's a, a nice way uh, to do that. There are a number of different ones. Um, protecting your hearing in noisy environments is important. Cotton balls are the same thing as a glass picture window to light. Sound goes right through them. You need to get like the foam rubber earplugs. If you're doing really noisy things like a chainsaw, both in the ear foam and over the ear muffs are prudent, belt and suspenders. There are some drugs that we doctors prescribe that can injure the ear. As a rule of thumb, it is not a pill. As a rule of thumb, it's through the vein. So if any of you here have significant hearing loss and you ever need treatment for serious infection by the vein in the hospital, when you come in, you or your family should mention to the doctor, hey, my family member has hearing loss. When you treat that infection, try to use something that doesn't hurt the ears. Because in fact, the aminoglycosides, genomycin, 
canamycin, those kinds of things can hurt the ear intravenously. And it, I often see people who had serious infections, life-saving treatment, but it made their hearing much worse. Whereas there are alternative drugs very often that don't hurt the ear. The, um, the more difficult situation is cancer treatment where there are platinum drugs called cisplatinum that injure the ear. But there are ways to protect it some by giving the medicines very slowly, by using lots of fluids and things, and keeping the ears at rest. Now let's just, I'm gonna briefly mention a little bit about inner ear dizziness and balance troubles. Now, just like there's glaucoma in the eye, where the eye gets high fluid pressure, there is also a similar situation where you get high fluid pressure within the inner ear. It turns out the fluid-filled membranes within the cochlea and semicircular canals are a lot like a complex series of water balloons. And there's a place where the fluid is secreted in and a place here called the endolymphatic sac where it is excreted and resorbed. What happens in a person with Meniere's disease, which is the popular name for high fluid pressure in the ear or endolymphatic high drops, is that that fluid space gets plugged a bit like having hair in the bottom of a sink. So you're still pumping in the liquid, but the liquid can't drain. Well, what does that cause? It causes a sense of plugging in the ear, just like coming down in an airplane. Noises, whoosh, often low frequency noises, and when the pressure gets really high, that little blue membrane pops. And when that pops, all heck breaks loose. You have a horrible vertigo attack. And it often goes on for four to six hours with nausea and vomiting, and it's quite miserable. Not terribly common, but not all that rare. So the hearing loss here, as you notice, is not in the highs, but is in the low frequencies. Now, every once in a while, someone suddenly goes deaf in an ear. Boom. It happens especially in older adults. It's probably a little blood clot. For example, if you have atrial fibrillation or if you have um, a tendency to form blood clots that goes off and blocks the little blood vessel to the inner ear. And that can happen. Sometimes we can treat it with an injection in the ear. We treat it with steroids, and it often recovers. However, most of the hearing problems I've told you affect both ears equally, getting older, noise. There are a few circumstances where one ear progressively goes deaf. And so here you see the left ear is normal, the right ear is down about halfway, and the clarity score is 100% for the left, but only 30%. Now, 30% clarity is very distorted. It's like Donald Duck or a, a, a radio station almost off the station, very, very scratchy. Now, this is a rare condition called, uh, uh, it's a tumor of the hearing nerve called an acoustic neuroma. And here you see the hearing and balance part of the ear and a tumor growing on that nerve. And here on an MRI scan, you see that tumor. Now, I don't want you all to worry that any of you have this. It's not that common although it is something I spent my career taking care of. As they grow, they begin to push against the brain and can become very serious, although this day and age, they can routinely be cured in a variety of ways. Now, just to share with you, you might say, how the heck would you figure out when you have a hearing loss, whether it's in the eardrum and hearing bones, whether it's from the inner ear, or whether it's from the nerve or brain, because you have that whole pathway that can go off. I'll share with you one of the principles of this, just because it's interesting. So you all know there's an electroencephalogram, or EEG. All that is is putting a bunch of electrodes on the scalp and measuring the electricity and the waves that come from it, okay? So imagine what you're gonna do is you're gonna give a pip in the ear that's like hitting many keys on a piano all at once. So the nerve has now a volley of activity going up through it, all together. Every nerve fiber has been activated. What happens when the nerve is sick is that some fibers go slower and some go quicker. And what the computer does, it looks at the EEG in resting periods and then the EEG in a few milliseconds, thousandths of a second, following the PIP. From that, we see a series of waves, and I can tell you whether it's from the inner ear, the eighth nerve, the brainstem, from that. So just to, this, just to illustrate the point of some of the sophisticated diagnostics that can happen. 
Now let's talk about treating hearing loss and restoring hearing loss. So I'm going to give you a tale of two ears. The type of ear problems that we can routinely cure today and the type of things that we hope to be able to cure in the future. So we'll talk first a little bit about surgical restoration of hearing. For those of you who remember Mike Tyson and his a little bit more exciting ear surgical days. <laughs> now, turns out, and this gets a little technical, there's something called conductive hearing loss. And, and we use the comparison of a vibrator on the bone and a speaker over the ear. When the speaker over the ear, you don't hear very well, but you can hear it on the vibrator, we know there's something going on such as the bones are broken, as seen here, or there's a hole in the drum. This is the normal drum, but there's a hole, and we're actually seeing the hearing bones through the eardrum, right? Now, ear surgery is all microsurgery. It's all done with a big, powerful microscope. Some things are done through incisions, but there's a bunch of things that can be done, as seen here, working through the ear canal. It's a little bit like a jeweler. It's very fine, very delicate surgery. You can see some of the instruments used, and these are really minuscule. With your naked eye, it's hard to tell what they are. Now, let me share with you an example of what can be restored. There's a disease called otosclerosis. Odo is ear, sclerosis is hardening. And so here you can see little patches around the inner ear, but you see that calcium patch right there? When the eardrum vibrates through the linkage of bones, that third bone pumps the hearing in the inner ear. When it gets calcium, it gets blocked and can't move anymore, and the hearing goes down. It's widely believed that this was Beethoven's source of deafness. Okay? Now what can be done in the modern era is that stapes bone can be replaced by a fine little wire and piston connecting from the incus, the second bone, to the inner ear. The probability of restoring hearing in this is very high, and about 90% of people who have this operation have hearing restored to normal or near normal ranges. So it's a real triumph of this. Now just to give you a sense, very quickly, this is the ear canal and eardrum. Here's the second, and this is the stapes bone and this is the inner ear. So we move aside the eardrum, you see here. We measure from the incus to the foot plate, four and a half millimeters, kind of a comma on a piece of paper. It's all tiny stuff. We then separate the joint between the incus and the stapes. We then make sure the outer bones move. We cut that little muscle I mentioned earlier, remove the top of the stapes, and you see that calcium fixing it here? We then, with this drill, is 0.7 millimeters in diameter. And we're making a hole that's 0.7 millimeters to put a 0.6 millimeter piston through. And if you go more than half a millimeter in, half a millimeter, right, you'll kill the ear. So it's extremely precise to get this right. And here's the wire coming in. And then the wire is attached onto the incus by a little crimping device and seated, and that's what it looks like completed, to restore the ability of the vibrations from the eardrum to move the inner ear fluids and give you hearing, okay? Now, you might say, what if the other bones are gone? So if we've lost all three of the hearing bones, we put in something called a total ossicular chain reconstruction. It's a piece of titanium. It's affectionately known as a TORP. There are also partial ones if you still have Bone. So, so the middle ear problems of the eardrum and the hearing bones, we can do a great deal about in contrast to the inner ear. Holes in the eardrum, here's a little one, a larger one, three quarters of the drum, and here a total perforation looking through to the incus and stapes. Now you might look at that and say, what can you do about that? And the answer is fix it reliably, routinely with a minor operation. How do we do it conceptually? We make a little incision in the ear canal skin. We turn the eardrum forward, so we're on the underside of it. We take a piece of the patient's own tissue, slide it underneath, turn the eardrum back, and that graft grows blood vessels into it, 95% or more, and will repair the hole in the eardrum with resolution of infection and restoration of hearing. Now there is a disease called cholesteatoma. Cholesteatoma is when a pocket of skin grows in from the eardrum. You know, when you rub skin, little white flakes come off. 
and skin wants to be on the body surface. So if you get a pouch going in, all those white flakes build up in it. And it's a form of chronic ear infection. And, what, and, and this brings up the concept of what's the mastoid. Many of you may have heard of the mastoid. Well, if you think about it, you have a nose and you have sinuses in your cheeks and your forehead. That's basically what it is for the ear. You have the middle ear behind the eardrum, and then you have this honeycomb bone behind. And here it's been opened surgically. That's what's called a mastoidectomy, to open it up. And that's sometimes necessary in disease. Cholesteatoma pushes back into the mastoid. You see that white pouch like that. This type of disease usually has bad smell and pussy drainage from the ear. It's not a very nice thing, but it can be cured. Often when we cure it, we use a laser. Why? Imagine you have some of this abnormal membrane on the stapes bone here. If you went and handled it with an instrument, those vibrations would represent a huge sound to the inner ear and hurt hair cells. So to avoid those vibrations, we use a laser to vaporize the disease from the stapes without causing any vibrations. Now, interestingly enough, the genetics of hearing loss have been studied a great deal over the years. And the molecular genetic revolution have brought a huge knowledge about what goes on in the genetics and the different chromosomes in the ear. And in 2013, we can often do gene testing. You know, it's been said that in the past, to evaluate a patient with hearing loss, we would examine the ears, we would get a hearing test. But in the future, we're going to examine the ears, get a hearing test, and we're going to study your genome. We're going to sequence your DNA. Why? Because many forms of hearing loss, in fact, run in families, not just those in babies born deaf, but in those of us who lose hearing more rapidly in our 30s and 40s, or even folks who lose hearing in their 80s more than average. Now, what's known is there are um, now um, many over a 1,000 discrete mutations involving all 23 human chromosomes. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you that code necessary for function of the ear is present all throughout the human genome. We know now that certain types in Caucasians, so-called connexin mutations, about half of early acquired hearing loss now in children who are Caucasian are related to this particular mutation. We can do a blood test, send it to the laboratory at Lucille Packard, and within a day or two, we'll get back the exact type and the exact problem. We can test in adults and others. There are some labs that will do very extensive testing to identify the specific genetic cause. So those of you who have families with hearing loss, cousins, uncles, aunts, siblings, these are things that can be studied to help us understand who's at risk and maybe be extra careful around noise and things like that. Now, you know what's happening today, this slide shows Moore's Law. I got to say something about computer science here in Silicon Valley, right? Moore's Law, many of you know, talks about the rapid way with which computer processing increases every year, right? Doubles every two years, I think, right? The sequencing cost, you remember the Human Genome Project, $3 billion to do one genome. We're down now around 1000 bucks. And within a few years, we'll be down to $100. And the entire genome can be sequenced. Much of this technology came out of labs on this campus, not far away. So it teaches us about how the ear works. So what, you know, people wondered, OK, the human genome's been all sorted out. So what? How did that help us? Well, once you know what a gene is, you can elaborate its product, its protein. And when you know that protein, you can say, here we have a protein, That's because that's what DNA codes for, that is essential for function of the ear. And then you can say, OK, why is this person losing hearing? What is it that's missing? And then from that, you can go and study a lot of these detailed molecular machinery about the ear to help us have better strategies to replace what's missing. Now, just as a brief um, introduction, um, when I came to Stanford 10 years ago, I wanted to build a program. And I didn't want to build something that was incremental. You know, most of science, you make small changes, right? If you look at what we've done in polio, that's a large change, right? Largely eliminated from the world. Very little research had gone into curing inner ear hearing loss, which is the loss of hair cells. The vast majority of hearing loss is the loss of those cells in the inner ear. 
So I was able to recruit to Stanford Stefan Heller, who is the man who first discovered the presence of stem cells within the inner ear that can be differentiated into hair cells. So we have a large group of people working to overcome deafness through regenerative means. For the mice in the room, I've got great news for you. <laughs> you know, we're a long ways along, but we are aiming towards humans. We want to cure older people with hearing loss. We want to cure babies born deaf. And because almost all forms of deafness are hair cell deafness, and I'm talking about most forms of hearing loss are that, if you can regenerate those hairs, you can restore hearing to the inner ear. Now again, this is, we saw this earlier, these are the hair cells. What happens with hearing loss is you start to lose the outer hair cells, and this is what you form. It's a scar. It's a series of cuboidal cells where the hair cells used to be. This is the substrate that we act upon to restore hair cell populations to it. And this just shows you what happens in hearing loss. My colleague Nick Blevins is a wonderful animator. He's also an ear doctor. But just shows how the outer hair cells go, the nerves die back a bit, and then the inner hair cells go. And this part of the cochlea, this frequency domain, is lost hearing. Notice the nerves are still there. Okay? When people say nerve deafness, it almost never is. The nerves are still there. Okay? So why is it that the inner ear is a favorable place for regeneration? Well, you know, when you think about stem cell therapies and regeneration, it's mostly places like the bone marrow, right? And people with leukemia and things like that, right? Um, solid organs are a challenge because of architecture. If you've lost your kidney and you have to make a new kidney, you've got all this complex structure that has to be reformed from the get-go. The same is true with the liver and many other areas. When you have a deaf inner ear, you still have the elegant cochlear spiral. You still have all the nerves splayed out tonotopically in all the right frequency orientation. So the target for this solid organ is to replenish the sound sensing apparatus. It is more readily possible, at least in theory. Now we've known, going back to the 70s, that actually hair cells regenerate in chickens and in reptiles and amphibians, but not in mammals, not in humans. So, you know, when you think about regeneration, it shouldn't be that much of a miracle. When you cut yourself, it heals, doesn't it, right? Many things regenerate in the body. Now, a stem cell, uh, my definition I like best, is a spherical cell which, when injected in a laboratory animal, produces a scientific <laughs> paper. <laughs> yeah. Now, there are many potential sources of cells to restore this. What seems to be the most popular concept today is not the embryo, is not the umbilical cord, but is rather the person's own tissues. It's called induced pluripotential cells. Someone gathers some skin or a little bit of fat from the person, takes those cells, de-differentiates them, and turns them into hair cells. This, even in human tissues now, can be done. Okay? We're not there clinically yet, but we're getting there. And the concept being is to take a progenitor cell and through a series of molecular manipulations that are, that are similar to what happens in development when an embryo is developing, to, to coax that cell to become hair cells and to reimplant on that deaf membrane to restore hairs. Now, it is interesting when you replace hairs, the nerve fibers sprout back towards them if you have living hairs there. And there's a number of ways those hair cells might be brought in. Now imagine you have a child or an adult who has a genetic flaw. So if they have a genetic flaw that hurts hearing, if you took their skin and you grew it into stem cells, it would grow right back up with that same genetic flaw. So there you have to fix the code in the DNA, don't you? And that's where gene therapy, and gene therapy mostly, this is designed as a virus, splices in a replacement DNA. We're a little further behind on this in hearing. But one of the strategies that's been used is to actually switch on genes that are involved in development. What do I mean by that? When you're inside your mom, you form a perfect inner ear, right? So all the machinery in your DNA that codes for the steps necessary to take a primitive cell and to alter it in the pathway, many different steps have to happen. So many people thought, this would be impossible, because you'd have to have certain substances come and then go away and then be in the right concentration. How could you ever control that? Well, it turns out in the ear, there's a master regulatory gene called atonal homolog 1. If you flip that gene on, 
There's a self-organizing cascade of events afterwards that forms the inner ear. So by understanding key branch points within the genetic, within the developmental sequence that happen in forming an inner ear in a human embryo, and you can replenish that in an adult, conceptually you could restore the inner ear. And this just shows gene therapy conceptually. Now, it turns out that people are moving while cell therapy and stem cell therapy remains important. What a lot of people are moving to are small molecule messengers. So imagine if you could find a molecule that switched on that key gene, and you could just infuse it into the ear, and just in the ear alone, it switched it on. The problem with viruses, if I give you a virus that spreads throughout your body, well, you might get something happening somewhere you don't want it to. But if you can put a small molecule, and you might say, how could you ever figure it out? There are systems today called high-throughput screens that will screen 1,000 or 100,000, I should say, molecule candidates against a given gene activity robotically in a few days. So the, the, the coming of the bioscience revolution and the, the integration between um, often um, uh, computer therapy, computer type based digital processes and wet biochemistry, things like gene chips, which are a hybrid of those two technologies, have come along. So this just shows um, the idea of regenerating that cell and differentiating it. Um, you also need to proliferate it, otherwise, you'd run out of cells. Um, now, our goal is to cure a deaf mouse and then cure deaf humans. Now, I'm quite confident that this will happen, but like any good science, I can't promise you exactly when it's going to happen. I will tell you that I'm optimistic that we will have clinical trials of regenerative strategy to overcome major forms of hearing loss in 10 years. If you ask me in five years, I might say the same thing. <laughs> but one never knows. And, and you know, we're putting a lot of resources into this, and we're not just betting on a single way. We actually have four major lanes, and we're emphasizing a bunch of different areas. And as we see promising areas emerge, we will concentrate our resources in those things that are coming closest to the finish line. Now let me give you some idea about ear devices and, and hearing devices. Now, ear devices used to look like that. They used to be very visible. Um, they carried a stigma to people. They're becoming more and more small and less and less conspicuous. This is most contemporary hearing aids today actually fit outside and have a little clear plastic loop going in. Why is that better than sticking it in the mouth of the ear canal? Because if you cork the mouth of the ear canal, it doesn't sound natural. It's better to have the ear canal open. And these types of designs do that. Hearing aids today are fully digital. They've come a long ways. They do a number of tricks. The biggest challenge isn't understanding a person face to face in a quiet room. They're great at that. The biggest challenge is a noisy place where there's competing noises. Because hearing aids make everything louder, not just what you want to listen to. Now, more and more high speed processing can recognize noise from human speech. Devices today have some simple little tricks. They'll have a microphone in front and one in back. It knows the one in front's likely who you're talking with, and the one in back is likely noise. So it de-emphasizes the frequencies it picks up on the back microphone and, and strengthens the one from the front. Now, hearing aids a few years ago were in the mouth of the ear canal that was very popular, but they don't sound quite as well. But what we're seeing is that they're moving deeper and deeper in. Eventually, as you see on the right, they may be fully implantable, but that's not here quite yet today. This is a device that I'm really excited about. It's just being developed and will be coming out soon, and it's a photonic hearing aid. What it does, and it's from the EarLens group, um, one of our um, clinical faculty member, Rodney Perkins, actually uh, runs the company and developed the hardware. It's a um, contact lens for the eardrum. But what's on it is a little photocell like you'd put on your roof to catch sunlight. And when there's a laser beam, one beam of the laser powers the photocell that runs a nanotech motor against the malleus. And then the second signal frequency um, is the frequency of the sound that's decoded there. 
Uh, this device is very clever because it directly drives the eardrum in a more natural way and it gets away from all the electromagnetic inf interference and it's all done with light. And this just shows how it works. Yeah. Still, you can't get it today, but it's coming along. Very clever idea. Give the idea of the kind of technological um, innovation that comes. Now, let me tell you, in those that are completely lacking hair cells in the inner ear, they're totally deaf, there is a really miraculous technology called the cochlear implant, some of you may have heard about. Remember what I told you. Hearing loss leaves the nerve fibers intact, and those nerve fibers represent every key on the piano, every frequency. And because of that, you can insert a wire into the inner ear that has a series of electrode pairs, and those stimulate and control different frequencies. And so if you can gather the sound presented across the skin, you can actually restore hearing. Now, it, this is what an electrode implant, this is behind the ear, the implanted electronics, and here's the wire coiling within the cochlea to be near the hearing nerve. This is a child um, shortly after an implant, but the thing to know is when we were all young, if you were born deaf with no hearing, you ended up going to a deaf school and learning sign language. Um, that's a proud culture, no question. But you can't join your parents if they're hearing in sign language easily. You can't go to Safeway in sign language and ask how much it is for a can of peas. You are isolated. You're in a deaf community. It's a wonderful community. But the vast majority of children born deaf are born to normal hearing families. And they want their children to come along. Today, no child has to remain deaf. With these devices, it takes a child from deaf to hard of hearing. And in fact, kids, when they're very young with their developing brains, by getting some pretty good sound in the ear, they actually do amazingly well. We have a number of students at Stanford, top students, who were born deaf and have cochlear implants, live in a hearing world, go to lectures, and understand everything very well. So we really can replace the lost inner ear with technology today when there's deafness. We'd rather prevent this, but still, it's quite remarkable. Now, let's talk a little bit about how important the ear is in the future as, a, as an interface. You know, we all think that the human body is going to interface someday man and machine. And I'm here to tell you it's probably going to begin first with the human ear. And that, remember Uhura from Star Trek here? You recognize her? Um, the interface between digital devices and the ear really matters. These Secret Service guys, you know, who proudly wear that, you know what they think that means? means shoot me first. They don't want to be seen, right? They don't want to know that's there. So hearing aids and hearing devices are becoming much more fashionable. And in fact, they're becoming very common. And I predict within a few years, as a consumer electronic device, people are going to be wearing devices in their ear all day long. And it's going to be more common to wear an ear device than it is to wear a wristwatch. Let's think about this. Okay, 30 years ago, we put computers on everybody's desks, right? Over the last 15 years or so, we've opened up outside to the internet and to the intranet within. But if you look at the last two feet between man and machine, you're sitting there on something invented by Smith Corona in the 1880s. You're typing, right? It's not very efficient. So that interface between man and machine, the last two feet, has many new, new things coming in the coming years. Now, we all know about voice recognition. This is now becoming very real. But you know, the human voice can easily give running speech if you want to write a letter or give instructions. But it can't point very well, uh, the human voice. You need something else. So I once mentioned this to Terry Winograd a few years ago. And I said, you know, it's so slow when you type. The, the information flow when you type is not nearly as fast as you can speak. And he said, Rob, you don't get it. Imagine the amount of information when a pianist plays Mozart. So imagine your interface with the computer in the future will be your voice telling it things and giving it speech, your eyes moving cursors and controlling and moving, your hands like the, like the Wii, you know, this is maybe an early version of this. But imagine to that computer you're going to be moving your hands in complicated and meaningful ways while your human voice and your human ears interface to those machines. And you've all seen the Google glasses coming along. Now, I've mentioned before that 
if you stick something on your ear, you're old and you're dumb, right? I mean, that's just the way people have thought about hearing devices. Why did that matter? Only about 30 to 40 percent of people who could benefit from hearing aids wear it. And almost anybody who needs eyeglasses wear them today, right? Now think about it. You take a piece of plastic and glass, you stick it in front of your face, and society says that you're either smart or you're stylish. You stick something in your ear and you're old and dumb. Now it doesn't make any sense. But the point I'm making is that is utterly changing today because young people are wearing ear devices all the time. It's becoming a badge of technological prowess. You know, Grandpa goes to the senior center, hey, look at what I got. You know, I got this razor, this really fancy one. So this is what's coming, it's different. I mean, this was the traditional hearing aid user in the past, but I'll give you an example of just how motivated people are. People will go and have a laser operation to get rid of their glasses, right? It's a very safe operation to do. Pretty safe, at least. There's that operation stapedectomy I told you about before. What I didn't tell you is it carries a nearly 1% chance of deafness in the operating ear. 1%. Now, if I told you I could get rid of your glasses, but there's a 1 in 100 chance I'd make you blind in the eye, you tell me to stuff it. Forget it, right? But if, instead of wearing, to not wear a hearing aid, people are willing to undergo that kind of risk. Chose the bias, if you will, against hearing devices traditionally. But today, Hearing devices are becoming youthful and stylish, elegance and beauty. Famous soccer players wear the things in advertisements. Brad Pitt, the digital gentleman and highly evolved human. Brad, Paris Hilton wears bling on hers. Even Jesus wears hearing devices today, you know? So what, what are these devices that we're going to wake up in the morning and stick in our ear going to do? They're, of course, going to be our voice-controlled telephone. Telephone, turn on, call home, and it will do that. that you can get this today. These are some first-generation devices. <laughs> <laughs> it's your interface to the computer, of course. It's your ear pod, right? You don't have to carry something around in your purse or belt. All of your music, all of your audiobooks. When you go into a museum, the systems will be universal. You walk up to a picture, picture, tell me about yourself. And through your ear device, it will do that. You go to walk across the street, and, and you're in London, and you look the wrong way, and there's a double-decker bus coming at you, that ear device will be, stop, back up, bus coming, right? It'll warn you, because you've got that in your ear. GPS, that's easy. You're driving down the street, where's 1212 Main Street, you say to it. And it says, well, keep going turned right in 100 feet. Now, it may be hard to imagine, but there will be technology soon for instantaneous translation amongst languages. Not in a little ear-level device, but imagine that this building has in it a high-speed architecture, and I have some fast successor to Bluetooth. You speak to me in Italian, and I can say, okay, would I like to hear it in an Australian accent, or a New York heavy <laughs> accent, or an Irish brogue? and you can dial that in. This is coming. There's not a question that this is going to be here. There are some early versions of this now. They're not great, but it will come in time. You know, you also have a web. So I'm walking up to that 1212 Main Street, and I ask my ear device, oh, I'm at John Jones's house. What's his wife's name? And in your ear comes Peggy, right? OK? All right. And now, mind you, once you've got this device on the human ear, you can extend the auditory range. You can hear at greater distance. It can, through signal-to-noise enhancement, improve your enjoyment of a restaurant by making the people you're listening to sound better. You can clarify in adverse environments. You can build in protections against loud noises. The thing can shut down or create anti-noise, like you've heard those noise-canceling um, sets. And by the way, once everybody's wearing these things on their ear anyway as electronic consumer devices, you just build in what's needed for hearing loss. Right? You just accommodate for it in there. Now, if you really want to get out there a little bit for you tech folks, you now have a telemetry system hung on the human body, constantly talking to a network. You can measure your blood pressure, your heart rate, your oxygenation. You can have a little sender on your chest and your EKG. So instead of knowing what your oxygen saturation is a couple of times a year when your doctor tests it, you can know it every minute. You can go online and see what your oxygen is every day. You can, so the appreciation of diseases, for example, like diabetes. 
you'll have a continuous map of 365 days a year of what your sugar is. Just like the astronauts did in Apollo in the 70s where they had all this monitoring, very conceivable once you have a telemetry system routinely hooked up to the human body. So with that wild and futuristic thought that's probably not so far away, uh, the ear's a cool thing. Every medical specialist talks about their specialty being the seed of the human soul. I like the ear for that. Thank you. Now, a uh, good time for some questions. How did I do on time? Oh, look at that. Wow. <laughs> Almost exactly an hour. It's amazing. We'll start from the front. Yes, sir. Do, uh, is it common to injure your ear with Q-tips? Um, the question is, is it common to injure your ear with cotton swabs? I'm not going to endorse Johnson & Johnson Q-tips. <laughs> Most, so, so if you think about the ear canals, just a skin line tube. There is a special adaptation at its entry that secretes earwax. It's not dirt. It's actually, you need it there. If you didn't have it there, think about when you wax your car and how water beads up. If you got water in your ear, it'd stick, and, and the earwax repels it. It's also important to catch bugs if you think about growing up in the jungle. They get stuck in the earwax. So all I recommend for cleaning earwax is a washcloth on your finger. Now because the wax only forms in the first part of the ear canal, if you take a cotton swab and go in, what happens is very much analogous to muzzle loading an old cannon where you're ramming it in. You get some of it out, but some of it goes in. And what happens is that the ear has a special adaptation to get rid of the wax in the outer third. But when you poke it in too far, it doesn't have those little hairs beating it out, and it builds up, and you get a wax impaction over time. So bottom line is cotton swabs, you ever notice the pictures show it like this? They never show it like this. They, it even says all over, don't stick in your ear. Of course, a lot of you do. But, uh, and it is possible to per per perforate your eardrum with them, for example. Uh, people come out of the shower on a slippery ground doing this and slide and do that. Yeah, and it makes you wince. But you've already learned, I can fix that. I really, <laughs> I'm not recommending it, and I don't want you to push it through to the other side. Okay? <laughs> or you can floss, right? All right. Yes, ma'am. We'll come back. My audiologist tells me that I should wear my hearing aids now and not to wait for too long because of the communication between the, the nerve cells and the brain that this cannot be, this connection cannot be restored. Yeah. But so, when you are restoring your hear cells, what happens then in the brain? Okay, so this is a sophisticated question and I'm gonna repeat it in essence is should you restore hearing early or because does it help the brain itself? Now, we used to think that the brain was rigid and immutable and never changed. But we have learned from recovery after stroke, for example, people who lose their speech, who some weeks later it grows back. People who can't move an arm and it partially or completely restores. Now, that's not just brain tissue healing. Actually, the dead part of brain is gone, but around it, plasticity, neuroplasticity happens. So imagine in the hearing part of your brain in the temple that those frequencies, the keys and the piano, imagine a series of, like a rainbow of different frequency bands. If you've lost your high frequencies for many years, nature is very economical. It's going to reassign that part of the brain to other purpose. So there is a reason to restore hearing as close to normal as you can rather than wait until you've had many, many years of hearing loss. Now, if you take someone who's been hard of hearing for 20 years and put a hearing aid on them, it doesn't mean it's gonna sound the way it would have to a 20-year-old. So some people actually have adaptive strategies where they gradually try to reprogram the brain map. These are things on the cutting edge, but they slowly restore it in ways that change things. Now, I'll give you another example to that. Let's say you have a very high frequency hearing loss, right? You can't hear much in the highs, a little bit. You could take your CD of Beethoven, and you could take that and you could alter it so that for a person with hearing loss, you'd make it fit the audiogram in a way so that the piccolos were made much louder but the, the bass kettles weren't, right? So you could actually digitally alter the sound to trick the brain and the ear, right? And this can be done actually today. But I think the issue of neuroplasticity, how the brain changes, is a sophisticated question. I compliment you. And there's a lot of study going on that now. Yes, sir. Uh, 
I've had difficulty not with ascent in planes, but with descent in planes, yeah. and I uh, uh, sometimes extreme pain. And I wonder uh, what can be done to alleviate that, and what kind of damage to expect from it. Yeah, um, this is a really common problem, and it's the one of flying in the ears. And I'm going to put back up an image to help explain this. Now, the ear has a space called the middle ear behind the eardrum, between the eardrum and the middle ear. And there's a tube that goes to the back of the nose called the eustachian tube. Most of you know about that. That tube sits closed, except when you swallow and when you yawn, it opens up. Now, imagine that the pressure in the middle ear is high. It's going to take, and imagine you have a flexible tube, it's going to blow it open. But if that's suction, if it's low pressure, which is what happens when the plane's descending, that low pressure sucks in the flexible tube and it locks closed. So let's talk about it. First of all, I want to tell you, as unpleasant as coming down in an airplane and having a stuck ear that's painful and doesn't hear very well, it's generally not dangerous. It happens all the time. Uh, why you hear babies crying on the way down in the plane? Because they're getting it, because babies' tubes are narrow and flexible. What I recommend for that is a few things. Um, when the plane first starts going down, start to get some liquids or chew some gum, because when you're swallowing, it opens. If you wait, let's say you're asleep, and you wake up while the plane's descending and your ear's already very painful, it is harder to inflate it. Now, to help it, most of you know this, you pinch your nose and blow hard. If you can also pinch your nose, blow hard while swallowing, it's not so easy, it will actually open up and pop it even better. If you land and your ear is still left up in the sky and it's still plugged, go to your hotel or go home, get in a warm shower, breathe lots of warm, moist air, and pop your nose. Now, for those of you who have this often, take some decongestant antihistamine, whatever works well for you when you have a cold or allergies, and do it about four hours before arrival so it absorbs in your system. If you're going to Los Angeles from San Francisco, you do it a couple hours before you leave. If you're in the middle of going to London, you take it mid-Atlantic. Also have some spray. By spray, I mean like neosinephrine or afrin. And when the plane starts going down, two puffs while breathing in in each nostril, let it soak in, and then two more puffs because you've got to get way to the back of the open nose now, and then follow that. There are some pilots and flight attendants who get it so badly, we put little tubes in the eardrum, just like we do in little children, to stem ear infections. In an adult, it's something that just takes a minute in the office to pop a tube in. The downside of having a tube in your eardrum is it's, you can't scuba dive, and you have to wear earplugs when you surface swim. Okay? Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Does scuba diving affect your ear, ears at all? Yeah. Uh, the question is, does scuba diving um, affect your ears at all? And the answer is, yeah, it affects a lot of things. <laughs> but but um, so it is the reverse of flying, interestingly enough. It's, uh, for those of you who've ever dove to the bottom of a pool and felt that first 10 or 12 feet is the hardest, actually. Um, and you know what I tell divers, if you can't clear by the time you're down 10 or 12 feet, don't push through it and keep going. Because if you get down to depth, and the ear suddenly pops open, you can get vertigo, right? Because the pressures underwater are much greater than the pressures at altitude while flying. You're not, when a plane is at 30,000 feet, your ears aren't at 30,000 feet. The cabin is at about 7,000 feet in altitude, okay? So now there are things that can happen at depth where great pressure, for example, if you don't come up from a saturation dive, say you've gone down 120 feet, and you come up too quickly, Nitrogen bubbles come out in the bloodstream. The inner ear is one of the first paces that is affected by that. And, and it can block and cause deafness. Uh, because the inner ear is very, needs a lot of oxygen. And it has, like the heart, when you block a coronary artery, it may lead to a heart attack. An ear attack forms when that happens. And there's, there's more to that if you have real interest in diving, we can talk after. Diving's tough on the ears. I recommend to my patients who only have one ear not to dive because the, the incidence of sudden hearing loss with diving, it's not that common, but if I only had one ear, I, don't, I think God gave you two, and when you're down to one, you ought to be kind of careful. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Are ma you seeing an increase of uh, ISSHN, if that's what it's called, the idiopathic sesamineural hearing loss? Okay. Um, 
The question is, am I seeing more people whose ears suddenly go deaf? And the answer to that is I, I don't think so. Now there are some, you might give you a little sense of that. Patient often wakes up in the morning and suddenly realize they can't hear in one ear and it's ringing really loud. Or they all of a sudden in the day, you know how we all get that for a couple of minutes where your ear rings? for a couple of minutes and then you know but it just does that and the ear cuts out it can happen to young healthy people or it happens to older people more most of the time in young people it's an inner ear virus just like you can get a cluster of cold sores on your lip you can get a virus blooming within the inner ear can damage it severely sometimes we treat it i don't think i've seen epidemiologic clusters or um uh, or a lot that's an interesting question anyone else um, let's, we'll go right across here. There you go. Can you talk a little bit about tinnitus. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. About tinnitus. Uh, that's tomato, tomato, tinnitus, or tinnitus, right? All right. Um, tinnitus is the medical term for ringing in the ears. Most of us who are older have ringing in the ears all the time. I have in a quiet room. I hear both of my ears ring all the time. Now, what that is is when you when we're young, we already start losing some of our high pitch hair cells, right? The nerve fibers that go to those hair cells, when that sound sensing cells are gone, they become irritable and start to rhythmically discharge, even though no sound's coming in the ear. And because those nerve fibers are hardwired into the hearing part of the brain, in that case, the high frequency part, you hear like that. Now, the vast majority of us with ringing in the ears, you get used to it, doesn't bother you much. When you're in a quiet room, it might bother you some. What I tell people is that your perception of the ringing is always a balance between healthy outside sounds coming into the ear to keep it busy and that obnoxious inside sound. So if you turn on some soft music in the background, some people use environmental noises like a fan. Some people um, have um, you know, sounds on their iPod like wind blowing through the trees and things like that. Um, on rare occasions, a very few people really find it very difficult. Um, they're often very productive, uh, very um, uh, people who work really hard and really need to relax, and then they get into relaxation mode and they can't stop thinking about it, right? It's not really about the ears in a way, it's about needing to relax and having difficulty. And often, again, I will stress to you that amongst the probably 30 million Americans with ringing in the ears every minute of their life, and about everybody over the age of 70 has this, or not everyone, but almost, um, the vast majority of people just shrug it off and don't bother them. But there are a few people who it bothers, and there are a number of techniques to help suppress it. There's not a cure for it. You certainly, if you have ringing in the ears and it troubles you, should stay away from aspirin and aspirin-containing products. You should be careful about loud noises. Just like if you have a sore knee, you're not going to run a marathon, right? Because it will stir up the ear uh, in that way. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'm thinking. Um, I uh, got a hearing aid in 2007, and it was a little autocon. And it was so small, I lost it about a month ago. So now I'm looking at replacing what would be the best course of action. All right, so the same thing, get, what do I do? Okay, so the question is, I had a hearing aid, I lost the darn thing, I'm kicking myself because it ain't cheap. Well, let me start out on the eight cheap point. I think that hearing aids are absolutely unconscionably expensive. They are ridiculously expensive. I think this is an industry that is ripe for disruption. I will disclose that I work with a company that's looking to turn your iPod or your, your phone into your hearing aid for $2.99 plus your earphones, right? I mean, so, so if you rip apart a hearing aid, it probably costs the manufacturer 40 bucks in materials and things like that. And they're charging three and four thousand dollars a piece. Hey, it isn't you know, we at Stanford have a very sophisticated hearing center, and we do dispense hearing aids, but we're stuck by what manufacturers do. This is ready to be disrupted. It is unsustainable. There are many older Americans on pensions or in Social Security that just can't afford it. Medicare doesn't pay for hearing aids. Most health insurance plans don't pay for hearing aids. So after that bully pulpit, so what is the champagne of hearing aids, you're asking? And it's not so simple. Okay, so I would go into your audiologist and I would be careful about hearing aid dealers, okay? Somebody on this is probably gonna send me death threats from hearing this. But there's a lot of folks who really have fairly unscrupulous business practice. You know, how much is it, sir? 
how much you got, that kind of thing. And, and, and you really need to work with a reputable person who spends time to carefully fit it. The way it sounds in a soundproof room in the audiologist's office isn't the same thing as when you're out with your friends playing bridge, okay? So you have to have a time to try it in day-to-day -day life and see whether you like it. And in the state of California and most other American states, if you're not happy with it, you bring it back and you get it changed. And if in the end of the day you really don't like it, you ask for your money back except for some mild fitting fee. There's not very much. So you have to work with the audiologist. I don't actually fit hearing aids myself, but um, there are a lot of good people around. But go to someone reputable if you can, okay? Yes, sir. About her question about when you should start hearing it, I know from taking my father to the audiologist, they always tell him this story, you have to start now because it'll be hard later. Well, there was a room full of the manufacturers over at Encina at a lecture one time, and when I asked them that, they said that's not true, you can start any time. Right, so the question um, relates to early fitting of hearing aids in early hearing loss as opposed to later when it's more severe. And I, look, I couldn't agree with you more. I don't think, so, so it's interesting. Recently, you may have seen in the popular press that people are talking about how hearing loss and dementia, Alzheimer's disease, seem to go together, and that, so now you got hearing aid dealers saying, get your hearing aid now so you don't go demented. Well, that's not necessarily true. So in general, if a person, it depends on your needs in life. You know, if you're someone who largely sits quietly with your spouse, and you, you know, you're not going out to lectures where it's hard to hear, you're not, movies usually aren't a big problem. You can get amplified telephones and televisions. There are all sorts of devices. You can go to listening assistive devices if you Google that. There are many companies that make things. On the other hand, if you're having trouble in day-to-day -day life, that's when you really need to think about it. And that's how I, I, I explain it to people, is the time. Now generally, you wouldn't wear eyeglasses with the lens on one side. So most people who have hearing loss in both ears, I don't recommend fitting just one because there is an advantage when both ears participate. You're able to listen and hear better in adverse listening situations better than just one. And that's frankly really the name of the game by and large is, is that ability uh, is really crucial to making hearing aid work. Now I'll tell you, hearing aids have come a very far way in the last 10 years in their capabilities, but they're still a long ways from being perfect and they're often limited by the ability of the ear to discriminate sounds. Making it louder doesn't always make it clearer, right? Yes, sir. Do, do you ever diagnose uh, ischemic auditory neuropathy? And how I know that it's a problem with the eye, and I'm wondering whether the auditory yeah. nerve sometimes yeah. is damaged by a lack of blood supply. Yeah, so the question is uh, ischemic auditory neuropathy, which is a lack of blood supply to the hearing nerve. The part of the brain stem where the hearing part of the brain is sometimes has strokes. A blood vessel comes, that's what a stroke is, is when a blood vessel closes or it bleeds and it takes out a portion of the brain. However, the hearing part of the brain is so near the seat of the soul <laughs> and the brain stem that if you get a major infarct there, you're usually devastated, it's not just hearing. So selective blockage of a blood vessel to the nerve or the hearing part of the brain is not that common. And, and you could take out one side hearing part of the brain completely, and you'd still hear. And the reason for that is there's a decussation, the pass cross. So you have two. You would have some difficulties, but you would still be able to hear in that way. Now, ischemic change, a blocked blood vessel to the inner ear, is common and can be quite serious, but not to the nerve so much. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I have difficulty uh, getting the meaning of something that someone else has, has said. Uh, uh, having having the, the sounds turn into English words in, in my head, so to speak. Right. And I theorize that I don't have a problem particularly with my ears, although I do have some, some hearing loss, but that it's further in. It, it's the brain trying to translate. Right. Does it make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. And the question was that I can hear things that go in my head and I don't understand. And I'm going to recommend marital counseling to you, sir. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> although I'll tell you that every wife in this room knows what I mean, <laughs> right? Um, um, there are occasional people with what are called auditory 
processing disorders. Now, I'll give you an example of something we can all relate to, and that is you're driving into an intersection and there's a bunch of cars coming from different directions, and you suddenly, whoa, your senses are taking all that in, and you're overwhelmed. You can't quite make sense of it. So there are people in hearing kind of that way. Some people, when they're distracted, it's difficult that way. There are some tests that can be done about central processing. It's become one of these things that has gotten a bit, bit too popular for children, the auditory processing disorder. You know, and yes, that's real, but it's also one of those things when your kid isn't going to well in school, it's easier to stick a disease name on it. And there's a whole industry of people who will charge a lot of money to try to, you know, um, make your kid do better. So um, I do believe you. There are people that have processing problems where sounds don't necessarily relate um, in the way you'd want. We can talk about it a little bit afterwards. Uh, but it's, it's not so much the ears, it's between the ears, how it's processed. And a lot of times it has to do with sequence and time, right? You just can't track that much at one time. And you get overwhelmed, like going, you know, sitting too close to the movie screen when the roller coaster scene comes on. And you're just, oh my God, it's overwhelming. There are people whose ears are that way. And there are also some people who just find sounds disturbing that just are what's called hyperacusis, and it just jangles them. We've all had times when sounds bother us, you know, fingernails in a blackboard being a common one. And there are some people who are just wired that way where it's difficult. I'll maybe take one more. You've all been a wonderful audience to stay this long. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Okay. Did you say that in fancy there is an auditory uh, place that we still have that all the do something or yeah. constituent uh, hearing aids? Yes, uh, so the question is, you might be surprised to learn at Stanford, we have ear doctors and audiologists and they fit hearing aids, yes. And um, you can, Stanford, so the, you could Google Stanford otolaryngology, which is the worst medical specialty name of all. <laughs> I'll share with you my fun story of that. I had a call a few years ago from a woman from Athens, Greece asking me about a condition and whether she should come to Stanford. And I explained to her, I said, you have to understand, I'm an otolaryngologist. That means an ear, nose, and throat doctor. And she says, I know, I'm Greek. <laughs> <laughs> so so if, you, if you go Stanford ear, you'll come up with it. And they're happy, and my audiology group is happy to do hearing tests and fit hearing aids, either with your family doctor or your ENT doctor. Um, and we are actually open, interesting that you asked, um, we're opening the Stanford Ear Institute next year. So you may know on Watson Court, down by 101, there's an eye institute. The other wing's going to be an ear institute. So we've always taken care of things like those tumors I showed you, very complicated problems. But we're actually looking to be very comprehensive in a very integrated hearing health care center from, from little children to older adults. And so everything's in one place. So it's really very friendly. Uh, to patients. So um, I thank Stanford Hospital and our medical school for being willing to invest a lot of money in this and doing it right. Um, but we should be able to provide very, well, we already do provide excellent service, but it's going to be even more convenient and well integrated. And God knows there's parking, which is probably the most important <laughs> thing of all. All right, with that, I'm going to leave it. We can, uh, all right, go ahead if you're. I just wondered, uh, it seems that after you wear them a while, your hearing actually decreases when you take them off? So the question is, when you've been wearing your hearing aids for a while, mm -hmm. your hearing seems to decrease when they're off. So I haven't heard that. I will tell you that modern hearing aids have what's called compression circuitry. If they just made everything louder, imagine you took a loud thing and then made it super loud. It'd be bad for the ear. But they actually compress down so that something that's loud just passes through. It even compresses it. So that is not usually the case. It may be simply that when you've been wearing them, you're hearing better, and you take them out. You know, it's, it's like walking into a movie theater from the bright sun, and suddenly I can't see, right? So um, you may, an hour or two later, not be any different perceptually than you were in the morning. With that, we'll stop. I will stay here for a few more minutes if a few of you have questions. You've been great, really interesting questions. I want to thank all of you for that. Thank you.